Our second panel of the morning is entitled simply Military Commissions. And our discussion this morning is actually set against the backdrop a fairly significant case out of the District of Columbia Circuit by Judge Robertson last November called Hamden. That case caused a pause in military commissions at Guantanamo Bay. As you may know or have heard, Judge Robertson held, and I'll simplify the ruling if you'll permit me, that the President was not empowered to make the unilateral determination, which he did in February of 2002, regarding the application of the Third Geneva Convention to those captured in Afghanistan. That determination Judge Robertson held could only be made by a competent tribunal convened under Article 5 of the Third Geneva Convention. Since that procedure under the Geneva Convention was not followed, said Judge Robertson, those individuals are presumed to be prisoners of war. And if they are presumed to be prisoners of war, then yet another article of the Third Geneva Convention, Article 102, precludes the use of a military commission, simply because Article 102 says that those who are detained may only be prosecuted by the same types of courts used by the detaining power, and those would either be courts martial or trial in federal court. Now, that case was argued on appeal before the D.C. Circuit yesterday. You probably read about it in the paper this morning. It was front page stuff. I don't know what the D.C. Circuit's going to do, but regardless of what the circuit does, I suspect that case is headed up to the United States Supreme Court one way or the other. It is a very, very significant issue. Now, presumably, the administration even if it is reversed in its policy all the way up through and including the United States Supreme Court, could presumably send a small group of Army officers down to Guantanamo Bay, run these competent tribunals under Article 5, and then the military commissions, according to Judge Robertson's ruling, presuming that they're all determined not to be prisoners of war, could proceed. Uh, candidly, from a political point of view, I just don't think that's ever going to happen. Now, there are, in fact, several types of tribunals that are being conducted in Guantanamo Bay. And I, I think I need to explain this before we get into dealing with military commissions friendly. Military commissions are a prosecutorial forum. They are a criminal forum for prosecuting violations of the law of war. That is their only jurisdiction, violations of the law of war. There are other types of tribunals being conducted at Guantanamo Bay. The first one is the annual detention review. That was convened under uh, Secretary of the Navy England. That is to determine on an annual basis whether those we are detaining have continuing intelligence value. And if they do not, they will be released. And as you probably know from the papers, some have been released under that vehicle. There is another type of tribunal which interestingly was established I think about 10 days after the Supreme Court's decision in Razul v. Bush last June 28th, called the Combatant Status Review Tribunal. That tribunal has as its purpose only one thing, to determine whether individuals are enemy combatants or not. That is the question that is answered in that tribunal. Not whether they're prisoners of war, but whether they're enemy combatants. Both of those two types of tribunals I just mentioned are purely administrative in purpose and have no entitlement to counsel. Judge Robertson, in his ruling, right or wrong, said that neither one satisfies the dictates of Article 5 of the Geneva Convention. Only a competent tribunal would suffice. Interestingly, the only other reference in the courts of law other than Judge Robertson's ruling to a competent tribunal shows up in the Hamdi case by Justice O'Connor as a model to be used for the type of due process used for habeas petitions of American citizens. Now, I, I would suggest to you that our continued detention of captured alleged terrorists at Guantanamo Bay and our intended use of military commissions to prosecute those for violations of law or war, I think is perhaps the most, one of the most criticized aspects of our entire policy on the war on terrorism. Certainly among our international colleagues and even among some of our allies, 
All this procedure for detention and military commissions flows from the President's military order of November 13th of 2001, styled as a military order, not as an executive order, because its whole presumption is that it flows from the President's authority as Commander-in-Chief, not from the executive authority. Members of the review panel that already have been appointed are authorized to be temporary major generals, all within the military authority. But unless you get into the weeds on military commissions, unless you understand or have read all the military commission orders and even some of the instructions that have been issued, the nine instructions, there is a great deal of confusion and naivete in this country about what military commissions are and what they are not. That is our purpose this morning, to hopefully, through a great panel of experts, uh, give you information about the tribunals, the military commissions, and then to allow you to make the judgment. We seek not to persuade you one way or the other, only to give you the information so that you can then make your own determination on what these things are all about. Now, the first panelist this morning, and I'll introduce them all now so I won't take any further time from them. Our first panelist is Lou Fisher, Senior Specialist in Separation of Powers with the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress. He received his doctorate in political science from the New School for Social Research and started working with the Congressional Research Service, gosh, 1970, wasn't it, Lou? 1970. He served as research director of the House Iran-Contra Commission Committee in 1987, and he actually wrote, authored several major portions of the report. Throughout the years, Lou has taught at many, many colleges and universities. Uh, he has testified, taught, testified before testify, that's the word, before Congress on a number of occasions. He's a prolific writer, and most appropriate to our purpose, he's written three books. The first one is Presidential War Power, which many of my students read. He also wrote a book on Nazi saboteurs on trial. This was the authoritative work on the Kieran case, the Nazi saboteurs of 1942. And most recently, and just published, and I'm not plugging it, Lou. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> it's, yeah, there it is up there. <laughs> Military Tribunals and Presidential Power. And uh, having read it on several occasions, I will testify that it is a very authoritative book. And Lou has won several awards for his writing and his scholarship. Our next panelist is retired Army Major General John Altenberg, who is the appointing authority for military commissions. He is at the top of its structure. In that capacity, General Altenberg reviews all charges and evidence against individuals the President has determined to be subject to the President's November 13, 2001 order. He also has discretion to approve charges alleging violations of the law of war and to refer appropriate cases to trial by military commission. Although some in the Office of Military Commissions are either active duty personnel or have been recalled to active duty, General Altenberg chose to retain his civilian status as the appointing authority. When he's not the appointing authority, which I don't think there is any other time when you've not been the appointing authority, John, he is a principal with the Washington, D.C. Office of Greenberg Traurig. And before joining the firm, he served with great distinction for 28 years as an Army lawyer, culminating in being Assistant Judge Advocate General from 1997 until 2001. He holds a BA degree in English from, and International Studies from Wayne State University, and his law degree is from the University of Cincinnati College of Law. Our third panelist is Tony Losey, a reporter for USA Today. She's covered the Justice Department and legal issues for USA Today for, gosh, over four years now. And before that, she was a member of US News and World Report's investigative team. Tony has also covered federal courts in Washington, D.C. for the Washington Post, the State uh, House in Massachusetts for the Boston Globe, City Hall and the Mafia for the De Philadelphia <laughs> Daily News. There's no relation between the Mafia and military commissions. <laughs> and organized labor for the Pittsburgh Press. Tony's a 1981 graduate of West, University, West Virginia University. Our last panelist is David Rivkin, who is a partner in the Washington office of Baker and Hosteller. He's a visiting fellow at the Nixon Center, a contributing editor of the National Review Magazine, and a member of the UN Subcommission on Promotion and Protection of Human Rights. 
Before returning to private practice, David served in a variety of legal and policy positions in both the Reagan and the George H.W. Bush administrations, including stints at White House Counsel's Office, the Office of the Vice President, and the Departments of both Justice and Energy. He has a Bachelor of Science degree from Georgetown School of Foreign Service, a Master's degree in Soviet Affairs, also from Georgetown, and he received his law degree from Columbia. David also is a prolific writer, especially in the areas of law of armed conflict and what we call the use in bellow, or the amount of force and type of force that you can use. That's our panel that we've put together, uh, the best we could do. And I would suggest there's no better panel to talk about military commissions in this country than those folks that sit before you right now. So Lou, without further ado, let me turn it over to you. This panel comes at a good time because we've been talking about presidential power, how much a president may do uh, independently without any uh, review by other branches. If you look at the tribunal cases or the handling of detainee cases, the Justice Department takes the position that this area is what it calls quintessentially executive, and that means that no other branch has a right to review, much less uh, countermand what a, what a president has decided. Uh, what, what the Bush military order on November 13, 2001 rested on inside the administration was the 1942 Nazi saboteur case, ex parte Kieran, which Bill Barr, the former attorney general, uh, who had also been head of OLC, and when OLC was on the fifth floor, it, it, it was in the room uh, with a plaque that said, in this room was the, held the Nazi saboteur case of 1942. So supposedly Bill Barr was the one who said that ex parte Kieran, in fact, he said this in an op-ed piece, uh, ex parte Kieran in 1942 is the, is the most apt precedent. That got me interested in that case, and when I got into that, I got in, interested in tribunals from George Washington to present time. And I have to say that it's not an attractive picture that you look at. There are a few incidents where tribunals were used, I think used in an, uh, an effective, justified way. On the whole, not. Uh, what the Justice Department is now doing, including the Hamden case that Scott talked about, is to look to early periods in the Revolutionary War for precedents to justify what President Bush wants to do. And part of the briefs by the Justice Department cite the example in 17. 80, where the British spy, John Andre, was captured and brought before a tribunal and executed. Uh, this is not a very good precedent for looking for independent, inherent presidential power, because there was no president at the time, there was no executive at the time. What you had in 1780, and you had from the Revolutionary War straight up to the Philadelphia Convention, was a one-branch government. You know, you only had the Continental Congress. There was no president, there was no judiciary. All three powers were in one branch. So looking at John Andre is not a place where you can find any sort of source for independent presidential power. Uh, also at the time that the Justice Department will cite that as, a, as an example of independent presidential power, but in fact the Continental Congress had covered this by a statute that it passed 1776, it provided that enemy spies, quote, shall suffer death by sentence of a court-martial or such other punishments as such court-martial shall direct. And it then ordered that the resolution be printed at the end of the rules and articles of war. So this was a, an example of the legislative branch through a statute and artic article of war filling the area and dictating how the executive shall execute it. Uh, during this time of the Revolutionary War, there are other precedents of interest and even contemporary interest because how much can you do by a military tribunal without relying on existing courts? And George Washington, as commander in chief, looked at the area and saw that many of the incidents coming up in the Revolutionary War could be done and should be done by state courts, should not be done by military courts. Also on 
we've been talking about Abu Ghraib, but how do you handle detainees or prisoners of war? And there were a number of incidents where British forces uh, mistreated Americans uh, as prisoners of war, and there was the question of whether George Washington and his troops should behave the same way. And uh, Washington was very clear on that. You do not treat prisoners of war, detainees, in a way that would offend humanity. And he did it not just on moral grounds. He did it on practical grounds as to how you fight a war. And the one thing I'm sure you all know about George Washington is that a fighting force is effective when there is discipline. That includes treatment of prisoners of war. And uh, discipline is what we did not have in Abu Ghraib. Some of the examples of how we've used military tribunals over the years, uh, Ingrid this morning talked a little bit about Andrew Jackson as commander in chief, uh, having a military tribunal in New Orleans and how he uh, had his troops uh, arrest a federal judge who granted a writ of habeas corpus. Um, uh, the judge did fine uh, Andrew Jackson a thousand dollars and later just before Jackson's death Congress passed a statute reimbursing him it was a very hard statute to pass he didn't want to reimburse Jackson by pe casting a shadow over what the the judge did actually more interesting from what Jackson uh, in the Seminole War um, there were two British subjects who were captured and brought before a military tribunal and um, one was executed, and then the sentence was to execute the second, but then the tribunal decided that he should be flogged and given hard labor. And nevertheless, Jackson overrode the tribunal, had the person executed. And I bring that up because this got before Congress. And Congress, the House and the Senate wanted to investigate it, and they asked President Monroe for the documents. And uh, I, I bring it up because this was not a presidential action. This was an Andrew Jackson uh, action and Monroe never resisted at all the investigation, the, the documents, and the House and the Senate debated it. Very, very critical as to what Jackson did and uh, came very close to censuring him. The example I would say of the best one where a military tribunal was justified during the military war, uh, again, Winfield Scott is general on his way to Mexico to take over the trips, had in mind military tribunals, he never claimed that there was any inherent presidential power. He tried to get Congress in advance to pass a statute to authorize it. Congress did not do that. And when Scott got to Mexico and announced the military tribunal, he based it as much as he could on articles of war already passed by Congress, had a statutory base, uh, also uh, ba uh, relied as much as he could on, on state law and always made clear that Congress, if it wanted to, since that's where the constitutional power exists, Congress at any time could come in and change whatever Scott had done. Uh, the motivation for Scott is even more important that he knew from military history that if you go into an, a, another foreign territory and your troops commit atrocities, and he was worried about his own because he had a lot of very young, untrained uh, volunteers. That's what he was worried about. He wanted to make sure that they were properly disciplined so that a guerrilla warfare wouldn't be built in Mexico against them. He knew that when France went into Spain, that French soldiers committed atrocities and the Spanish guerrillas were a result. So the tribunal in Mexico had a motivation to make uh, clear to Mexicans that there was a tribunal around that would be fair and just and would be as harsh or even more harsh on Americans than on Mexicans. That was the motivation there. That's about as good as you get on tribunals. Civil War had many major ones. Uh, the Henry Wirtz and the Andersonville trial of the prison. Lincoln in the middle of the Civil War had to deal with uh, Dakota tribes. Uh, the military people up in Minnesota wanted to execute around 303 Indians that had to go through White House review. Lincoln conspirators, and I want to emphasize here the four who were finally hanged, uh, the Lincoln conspirators, including Mary Surratt. Um, Attorney General Bates uh, objected to the use of tribunals 
And I think his point here is, goes to fundamentals. Um, he objected to the military tribunal for the Lincoln conspirators because the people who serve, quote, are selected by the military commander from among his own subordinates who are bound to obey him and responsible to him, and therefore they will commonly find the case as required or desired by the commander who selected them. Uh, Bates goes on to point out the essential differences between courts martial, uh, this is created by statute, and therefore required to fulfill legal duties, and tribunals created by a president or a military commander to serve that person's will. See the, the difference between legal duties and will. And that's been the basic problem with tribunals, including the Nazi Saboteur case and the Yamashita case in 1946, as the atrocities in the Philippines. Ex parte Kieran, I don't have time to go through all the defici deficiencies of it. There were so many that Secretary of War Stimson was very, very offended that the prosecution would be done by the Judge Advocate General Kramer and the Attorney General Francis Biddle. He thought it was just ridiculous to have two people like that taking time out in the middle of World War II to prosecute a case that could be done by anyone in the Justice Department. And it's particularly inappropriate to have the Judge Advocate General as prosecutor, because he should be at the end of the line making sure that justice has been done. Uh, there were so many deficiencies to the procedure that in November 1944, these were the, the Nazi saboteurs, of course, were the eight who came by two submarines and were picked up. Uh, you have to ask why there was a tribunal, because the person who turned himself into the FBI and helped the FBI find the other seven, George Dash, he was going to be tried by a civil court. Uh, the FBI agents interrogating him, yeah, you go before a civil court and plead guilty, and he says, is there any problem because I've got family in Germany? No, just go in and be quick. So he wakes up one morning and looks through the slit in the prison, and he sees a FBI agent reading the New York newspaper with Dash's photo on it. So he said, I'm going to go into civil court and tell the whole story, which would be how I turned myself into the FBI and help you, because the whole nation thought the FBI had this unbelievable ca capacity to find four people who got off in Long Island, four got off in Jacksonville, Florida. So that ended the prospect of a civil trial. You could, the United States could not afford to have that message get out to Germany and the rest of the world. The other reason for a military tribunal is that when the Justice Department, the Solicitor General's office and Judge Advocate General looked at what kind of penalty, it would be at the most 30 years but they hadn't done anything. They certainly had intended to commit sabotage. But uh, when they looked at it carefully, maybe three years, maybe two years, and President Roosevelt was determined that they be executed, and six eventually were. So those were the motivations behind a military tribunal. In November 1944, when two more came by submarine and got off in Maine and got down to Boston, eventually New York, they were picked up. Uh, by January 1945, they're about to have another tribunal. And the same people were there. Stimson was still there. Biddle was still there. Kramer was still there. Same cast of characters. And this time, Secretary of War Stimson was so furious by the whole thing, he lobbied Roosevelt, and then he got all the actors together, and to stop this nonsense. And uh, as, as a result, this time, you did not do a tribunal as it was done in 42 that was disowned, and instead it was given over to professionals uh, done up at Governor's Island. So anyone who's looking for the ex parte Kieran as a good case um, should know that the Roosevelt administration itself uh, found it so deficient it wasn't worth copying. I'll end with the basic concern about military tribunals that the Supreme Court in many cases has re repeatedly expressed concern about the concentration of power that exists in a military tribunal. That is, Franklin Roosevelt, when he created the tribunal in 1942, he was the one who issued a military order. He was the one who issued a proclamation. He was the one who selected the seven generals who sat on the tribunal. Roosevelt was the one who picked the two prosecutors, Biddle and Kramer. 
Roosevelt was the one who picked the defense counsel, all of them military people subordinate to him. By the time the tribunal finished, where did the court record go for final review? Dr. Roosevelt. So this is what the Supreme Court in subsequent cases was disturbed by, the concentration of powers really in one person, uh, in the president or his subordinates. In 1955, Justice Black wrote for the court Quote, we find nothing in the history of constitutional treatment of military tribunals which entitles them to rank along with Article III courts as adjudicators of the guilt or innocence of people charged with offenses for which they can be deprived of their life, liberty, or property. Another very interesting case in 1979, the TD case in, in the Berlin court, uh, U.S. Justice, U.S. District Judge Stern, rejected the government's position that the executive branch can determine by itself the availability of constitutional safeguards, such as the right to a jury trial. Such power, he said, would allow the government, and look at this in contemporary terms, quote, to arrest any person without cause, to hold a person incommunicado, to deny and accuse the benefit of counsel, to try a person summarily and to impose sentence all as part of the unreviewable exercise of foreign policy. All of that fits, of course, how the detainees and Hamdi and Padilla and the rest have been treated. Uh, it is said often that in time of war, the laws are silent. I think it's the opposite to me is, should be the test, that it's in time of war where the executive branch can do the greatest damage and civil liberties are at the highest risk. And it's a time of war where there has to be checks by the courts, by Congress, and by the public. I thank you. I'm going to uh, personalize a little bit um, what's happened in the last couple of years with regard to uh, what's happened with the Office of Military Commissions. So. Um, to, to start a timeline with the Presidential Military Order in November of 2001, uh, which was uh, uh, complemented, if you will, by the Secretary of Defense's Military Order the following March, um, the uh, creation of the Office of Military Commissions uh, occurred over the next several months. A chief prosecutor was selected. Uh, a chief defense counsel was selected. They started assembling people for the appointing authority in, uh, I believe, uh, sometime in August, I think, of 03, uh, they brought back a uh, Brigadier General from the Air Force to be the legal advisor to the appointing authority. During all this time, the appointing authority uh, responsibilities has been delegated to the Deputy Secretary of Defense. So he was, in name at least, the appointing authority. Um, it's, uh, and there were, there were lots of things going on that, uh, I think there were a couple of times when they thought they were going to go to trial right away. There was a, a fitful flurry of activity at Guantanamo to prepare a courtroom uh, in the spring of one year, and then, and then for some reason uh, they didn't move forward. Uh, a lot of it had to do with negotiations with other countries and, uh, and criticism of other countries as to the procedures, and they didn't want their citizens to be uh, subject to military commissions. Uh, at any rate, there were, there were lots of political issues and practical issues that kept the commissions from moving forward. Um, during all that time, uh, I had retired from the military and uh, had done some consulting work with uh, an international development bank uh, on corporate governance issues and then moved on to the private sector of uh, the practice of law with, uh, with Greenberg Trauer, I guess Scott mentioned. And uh, I was a pretty happy fella, you know, figuring out a, a second life in uh, you know, after the Army, post-Army. I'd gotten over my post-Army uh, blues, um, still had uh, the fifth child to push through college and pay for that, and uh, it's burned in my brain when I became uh, connected in any way with military commissions because uh, a very good friend of mine who had worked with me in Desert Storm when we were deployed with the 1st Armored Division had been killed in Iraq in a helicopter <laughs> shootdown on November 7th of 03. Uh, and, you know, for any of you that have experienced that, it's, it's that moment you never forget where you were uh, when somebody called you and, and told you that, uh, that uh, Gil had died. 
And uh, his burial was the following Friday, the 13th, uh, at Arlington. And the day before that, I received a phone call from the Office of the General Counsel, Department of Defense, asking if I could meet with the General Counsel the next day. I said yes. There was no mention of what the subject would be. I got another call the next day from the same office saying they had to cancel. Something had come up for the General Counsel. So I proceeded to Arlington to, uh, to bury uh, Sergeant Major Gilmore. And uh, I saw the general counsel there. He was, it turns out the reason he had canceled the appointment with me later that afternoon was because he had determined that he was going to attend the, the, uh, the burial of this the command sergeant major of the Judge Advocate General's Corps Regiment. Uh, he said, gee, why don't we meet? <coughs> We're standing right there waiting for the, for the hearse to come down the road. We had about 10 minutes before it arrived. And so he started talking to me about military commissions. And they had everything put in place except the appointing authority, and he asked me, do you have any ideas on who the appointing authority should be or how should we do that? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I have thought about it. I think it should be a retired four-star general. Uh, I gave him the names of two people that I thought would be perfect to be the appointing authority, two retired four-star generals that I knew personally. And I thought had the requisite uh, uh, background and skill set to be the appointing authority, because it is a quasi-judicial uh, role uh, not every military officer I've met would be appropriate to do that, especially line officers, but some I've met would be perfect, perfect appointing authority, and just the right attitude and values. I said, if you can't get one of the four stars to do it, then you should have an active duty three star, but I wouldn't go below an active duty three star. He said, well, what we're thinking about is a retired two star who's a lawyer and who has combat experience. Well, that's, that's a pretty small group of people, quite frankly. Uh, there's, uh, well, that, no, that's not true. Scott said his first name, first name was John. There's, there's at least three people I know that fit that description. But it's true that, uh, that I was one of them. So I said, uh, that's interesting. And he said, would you think about it? And I said, yeah, I'll consider it. But I'd have to talk to my law firm. And he allowed us how there were lots of other people that had to be involved in the discussion of this. And that it wasn't set, you know, that was just an idea he had. There were several other parties in the administration, not the administration so much as within the Department of Defense, that had other concerns. Some wanted to appoint a federal judge um, and, and, and lots of other ideas. And I said, well, I'll go back and I'll talk to my law firm and give them a heads up that this is a possibility, Wh which I didn't do at all, I can tell you. I mean, I, there's no way I'm going to go back to my law firm and say I'm thinking about uh, accepting a position with the Department of Defense. I've been with this law firm for exactly one year at that point. You know, and uh, so anyway, uh, I, I figured that was the end of it. And I, quite frankly, assume no one that I know a little bit about how business, I mean, I'm 60 years old. I've been around a little bit. He's probably talking, I'm thinking 10 other guys about the same thing, you know. So I don't feel special. I don't feel anointed. You know, it's just uh, I, I'm, I'm out there in the sea with a bunch of other people. I get a phone call a few weeks later. They want to talk to me. So I go over and I interview with uh, several different people in the Department of Defense and uh, admit that I haven't talked to my law firm, but assure them that I'll talk to them in case this thing moves forward. You know? And I promptly went back to my law firm and got back to work on the case I was working on, and I didn't say anything to anybody. <laughs> For the same reasons. You know? I mean, I'm not going to let them throw me around like that. <coughs> and uh, uh, there was another time when we talked some more, and I still didn't do anything. And he said, well, you're going to be my recommendation. Now, others may want somebody else, but the recommendation of general counsel is going to be that Altenburg be the appointing authority. And that's got to move up to the Secretary of Defense. Well, I still didn't say anything, but he called me three days later. I think it was a Tuesday, and he said, the Secretary selected you. <laughs> so I terminated the phone conversation and raced down to the managing shareholder of my law firm and said, i got to talk to you. <laughs> and I explained what had occurred the previous three weeks. And uh, to his credit, he picked up the phone and called the CEO of our law firm in Florida and told him that uh, this had been presented and that he thought the law firm should support it. Thought it was important that I do these, uh, th this, this, this function for the government. And uh, I'd point out that the person I'm talking about is a Democrat. But at any rate, he thought it was important that I, that I do this. I'm, I'm just saying that because he wasn't necessarily an administration favorite. And uh, so I said I would do it. I couldn't, I couldn't begin until, uh, until March. I thought I'd get over there in January. This all occurred in December. The announcement was made December 30th, I think. And uh, I, I had a couple of cases I just couldn't break away from. And uh, I had to complete you know, obligations I had to clients. So I didn't really begin work until March 17th. So on March 17th, uh, I became the appointing authority, uh, started figuring out uh, who worked for me and what was going on and where we were going to go. 
And I would tell you that in, in June, I approved uh, two, two charges, charges against two detainees and, uh, and referred them to trial, selected a commission. Uh, and in July, I approved the charges on two other detainees, uh, referred those to trial, selected a commission. Uh, we had hearings in August. There were hearings down at Gitmo. First hearings were in August of 2004. All blurs together for me now. Um, and they set trial dates for November and December. Went back down there in November to uh, further the hearings, you know, have more hearings and motions and, and voir dire and the like. And actually, the voir dire was complete by then. And the, pa and the panel was set. And, uh, and that's when the Hamda decision occurred in early November. And uh, the judge in Hamden, of course, stayed the proceedings in Hamden. Uh, I reflected upon that. Uh, I will tell you, there were people urging me to proceed. You know, don't you realize that the judge has only got jurisdiction over the one case? You know, I allowed us how I went to law school. I understood that concept. <laughs> um, my dad, the person telling me, had never practiced law. He was a lawyer, but that had never practiced law. Uh, uh, had a completely academic background. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I issued my own stay uh, in December and just held all the proceedings in abeyance so that we could wait to see what happened in, in this case. So that's, that's where we are. Um, the question came up several times yesterday about war. I agree war on terror is a terrible metaphor. I'm speaking for myself now. I do not represent the Department of Defense or the administration. Uh, war on terror is not an apt uh, uh, description of what we're about. We are at war. There's no doubt in my mind personally as a citizen of this country that we're at war. We're at war against Al Qaeda and like organizations who are intent on destroying us and on attacking civilian targets. That's, that's all I need to do my job to feel that we are uh, in an appropriate construct because we are at war. That's how we are at war. Um, uh, Professor Crenshaw yesterday alluded to the, the, uh, the two types of uh, analyses that you could make of, of, uh, of, a, of countering, if you will, terrorism or these kinds of acts. And one was a law enforcement construct and the other was the wartime construct. Uh, first proposed, I think, within our government by Bill Barr back in uh, the late 80s after the Lockerbie uh, bombing. And uh, it, it stayed there for years, and, and, and nobody did much with it. You know, obviously in 93, we went after the World Trade Center one bombing in a law enforcement mode. Uh, but then came Cobar Towers. Uh, then came the bombings in Tanzania. I'm leaving something out that happened in 96. It doesn't come to mind right now. And then came the bombing of the coal. And I think people uh, in government and lots of different agencies are determined by that time, you know, uh, Oh, I know what, in 96 there was, well, 95 was Kobar Tires, 96 was, uh, was, uh, was uh, Osama bin Laden stating that uh, we're at war with, uh, with uh, America and that uh, we're going to kill civilians. And in 98 was his fatwa, you know, directing people to kill people. You know? So, I mean, I guess technically that whole time we're not saying we're at war. There's no declaration of war by Congress, clearly. But, uh, you know, they, they certainly had indicated they were at war. And then, you know, if, if, if you're not convinced by any of that, then, you know, for sure, when they attacked uh, the civilian targets in New York, you know, that pretty much says that uh, we may be in a conflict here. Um, I mean, I'd even argue that the Pentagon's a legitimate military target, even though there are lots of civilians working there. Uh, it's just that. Uh, uh, anyway, for sure, New York makes us, uh, makes us at war. And so that's, that's what, uh, in my view, uh, provides for the, uh, the ability to use military commissions. And I'd say, in closing, that the concern for, um, for rights is met, I believe, by the fact that uh, there is a presumption of innocence for all the accused. The burden of proof is beyond the government to establish <coughs> proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, they have a detailed counsel. They have the right to a civilian counsel if they want. The proceedings are uh, prospectively open, although there are provisions for, for classified procedures. But they, they are presumptively open, uh, except for, for those possibilities that may develop. Uh, with that, I'll close and, uh, and look for questions. Thanks very much. I want to thank uh, Scott and, and Duke Law for inviting me down here. Um, I am by no means an, an expert on the law of war uh, or national security.
but I hope I can provide you some insight into the Bush administration's legal strategy in its war on terrorism from my ringside seat covering terror cases in civilian courts, the military commissions, the habeas cases brought by the, on behalf on, of the detainees at Guantanamo Bay, and uh, some FOIA cases that the ACLU and others have filed uh, in, in connection with torture. Back in November 2001, when President Bush announced that his administration would use military commissions to try foreign terrorism <coughs> suspects, his advisors claimed that a key characteristic of the tribunals would be control of the proceedings. They said no defendant facing trial by military commission would get away with the antics that Zacharias Musawi, the only person charged in the United States in the 9-11 conspiracy, was pulling in federal court in Alexandria, Virginia by acting as his own lawyer. That has not turned out to be the case. For observers, the Military Commission's first hearings, uh, first in, uh, last August and then again in November, created a sense of deja vu, despite assertions by the administration that military commissions would be faster and more efficient than federal courts the commission convened at Guantanamo Bay fell prey to Masawi-like uh, moves by Ali Hamza Ahmad Suleiman al-Balul, a Yemeni accused of producing an al-Qaeda recruitment video that glorified the October 2000 attack on the USS Cole that had killed 17 sailors. In less than three hours last August, al-Balul exposed weaknesses in the new military system of justice by challenging the authority of the commission's presiding officer, the use of secret evidence, and limitations on defendants' rights. Like Musawi, al-Balul admitted being a member of al-Qaeda. And like Musawi, al-Balul demonstrated an uncanny grasp of American justice and used that understanding to send the commission, especially its presiding officer, into a tailspin by rejecting appointed military counsel and demanding to represent himself. Administration officials likely would say that Musawi and al-Balul are perfect examples of al-Qaeda's sophistication. They would point to al-Qaeda's training manual, which urges its members to use the American courts and rights to their advantage to tie proceedings in knots and embarrass the United States. But I think there's more to it than that. This separate system of justice for foreign terrorism suspects and the civilian courts are being shown up by more than a couple of savvy al-Qaeda members. In large part, the problems stem from the administration's desire to control the flow of information in the name of protecting national security. The efficiency that the administration wanted for military commission trials of foreign terrorism suspects has been elusive because the new justice system has rules that are as foreign to the military officers assigned to carry it out as they are to the defendants facing charges in it. During its August session in Guantanamo, the Commission's presiding officer and its members stumbled in implementing rules that critics say are a throwback to military justice of the 1940s. Time after time, Army Colonel Peter Brownback, the panel's presiding officer, fell back on what he knows, and that is the court-martial system of today. In August, Colonel Brownback tried to keep al Balul from incriminating himself more than he already had, but the Colonel was wrong according to the Commission's rules. Had he let al Balul ramble on, prosecutors could have used whatever he said against him later on. The confusion over the new system continued throughout three days of hearings uh, in November for David Hicks, an Australian accused of being an al-Qaeda fighter. The commission, which was reduced by then to three members from six because of successful challenges by the defense attorneys, struggled with fundamental principles of law, such as ex post facto, and how information from expert witnesses can or cannot be used in court. The problems with the commission's setup and rules are significant, but there are other issues looming in the background. One is secrecy, and the other is the impact that evidence gleaned from the Pentagon's so-called stress and duress interrogation tactics will have on the Commission. First, to talk about secrecy. For more than three years, the federal courts have struggled with the Musawi case because of the enormous amount of secrecy surrounding the government's massive investigation of the 9-11 attacks. It took a three-judge panel of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals several months to sort out whether prosecutors had misled the judges on how much U.S. intelligence agencies had been telling the Justice Department about what al-Qaeda operatives in custody were saying about Musawi and his role, if any, in the 9-11 plot. There is so much classified evidence in the Musawi case that the classifiers, the redactors, whoever they are, can't remember from one footnote to the next what is secret and what is not. In September, the Fourth Circuit panel issued an amended opinion of a ruling it had made earlier last April regarding Massawi's request for access to three captured al-Qaeda operatives. By reading the original and amended ruling side by side, 
I noticed passages that appeared in the first ruling but were blacked out or redacted in the second version and vice versa. I know this may not sound like a big deal, but it shows an obsessive, inconsistent approach towards secrecy. The danger in this strategy is that it is giving enormous power to anonymous bureaucrats in the executive branch to decide what the public is told and what it is not. There seems to be a penchant to classify now and worry about it later. Secrecy also permeates everything at Guantanamo Bay in both the military commission's criminal proceedings and the administrative evaluations that the Pentagon has established for the detainees. In August, during voir dire for the military commission, the panel members themselves decided what they would answer in public and what they would answer in secret session. Because there is no independent judge, such important decisions are being made on the fly without any review by someone with knowledge of the law. It is possible that career military officers who are not legally trained could be mistaken about what should or should not be made public. The CSRTs, the Administrative Combatant Status Review Tribunals, have provided an significant insight into how the government has gathered secret evidence and how it intends to use it against the detainees. The purpose of the CSRTs, I believe, was twofold. One, to assess a detainee's status as an enemy combatant, and two, for use to show a federal judge that the detainee has been given all the process he is due in the habeas cases. About, about half, almost half of the detainees participated in the CSRTs, and I got to see a few of these when I was down at Guantanamo. When they did participate, they often spent one, two hours or more declaring their innocence, but also incriminating themselves as they went along. The CSRT sessions were extraordinary, not in what they revealed, but what they did not. It was clear to everyone, especially the detainees, that the decision about a detainee's status would be made in secret classified sessions. The open session involved what amounted to a recitation of accusations without much, if any, supporting evidence. Often the accusations, if taken one by one, appeared benign, such as a detainee traveled from Yemen to Afghanistan in 2001, or a detainee wore a Casio watch, which, by the way, terrorists like to use to set off bombs. The so-called recorder, who is as close to a prosecutor as one could get, did not call witnesses and rarely questioned a detainee or his witnesses in the open sessions. Now underway is a second type of administrative hearing, the annual review board. The purpose of these hearings is to determine whether a detainee remains a threat to the United States and its allies, and whether the detainee <coughs> continues to be of intelligence value to the United States. Like the CSRTs, the ARBs also rely heavily on secret evidence, and more than likely the same secret evidence. Much of that secret evidence against the detainees stems from interrogations of other Guantanamo captives. Several detainees have claimed that their words were twisted or misunderstood by government translators and are being used to justify their continued detention. And of course, other detainees allege that their confessions were the result of torture. Questions about the accuracy of translations were first raised last August during the military commission's voir dire when defendants and their linguists couldn't understand the government's translators. That problem has not gone away. At a CSRT for a 30-year-old Arab on November 11th, the translator allowed the detainee to go on for several minutes at a time before translating what he had said. I don't speak Arabic, but th I know there's no way that she was giving the military panel a verbatim translation of what the detainee had said. She had to have been summarizing it. Making matters worse, the translator's English was not very good. So it is possible that a lot of what the detainee said was literally lost in translation. The CSRT also uh, has revealed other problems with the quality of the secret evidence that the United States has gathered against the detainees. Some of it is from snitches inside Guantanamo. Yes, there are snitches at Gitmo who want better treatment. Other evidence comes from rival Afghan tribes who may have turned detainees over to American soldiers to settle scores that are centuries old. Still other secret evidence may have come from opportunistic Pakistani police who allegedly sold detainees to the United States if they couldn't afford to pay several thousand dollars worth of bribes in exchange for their freedom. It is true that the CSRTs and ARBs are administrative processes with lower evidentiary standards, but right now they provide the only glimpse we have of the quality of evidence that the administration is using to justify its decision to hold more than 500 men from more than 40 countries for more than three years. The second issue looming over the commissions, I think, is the legality and the reliability of the evidence that military interrogators have obtained via the Pentagon's so-called stress and duress interrogation tactics. 
you all lawyers can argue forever about whether forcing detainees to remain naked, short shackled for hours in extremely hot or cold rooms uh, with loud music and meow mix being pumped in constitutes torture. For the military commissions, I think the question is more, much more basic, and that is whether the information is reliable. Was it obtained voluntarily? FBI agents and Navy criminal investigators uh, and interrogators and lawyers who push back against the Pentagon early on about the stress and duress techniques, basically these people grew up in a system where they were used to the US law in military courts and civilian courts that coerced confessions was just were inadmissible. You could not get them into court. And if they did that kind of thing, they saw their cases dismissed. And it's that experience that very much defines their boundaries for what is right and what is wrong. Navy sources of mine believe that the Pentagon's stress and duress tactics also were flawed because they simply yield questionable results. These folks say harsh tactics don't work. Heather McDonald and I obviously have very different sources. Um, my sources believe that if gathering accurate and timely intelligence is truly your goal, why would you think of humiliating a Muslim man, especially a Muslim man? As one of my sources says, humiliation is the key to it all. If, if you don't, if, I mean, if you will get very little, if any, reliable information if you embarrass a Muslim man. They will tell you whatever they think you want to know to end the embarrassment. The documents obtained from the ACLU and some members of Congress from DOD uh, and the Justice Department indicate that there was and is a huge disagreement over the quality of the evidence gleaned from use of these stress and duress techniques. Some in the military believe that what they have learned is the greatest thing since sliced bread. FBI agents, however, roll their eyes, saying that the military's claims are quote unquote suspect at best, because what the military is crowing about is either old information or information that the FBI could have just as easily gotten by checking travel records, for example. Even though the military commission's evidentiary standards are relaxed compared to the civilian and military courts, this type of evidence obtained as it was is is what really is worrying the FBI and some of the Navy criminal investigators. Let's take an example of an interrogation tactic that an FBI agent actually witnessed at Guantanamo and told his superiors about last August. This agent saw a detainee short shackled, naked, and kept in a room for 18 to 24 hours. The room was extremely hot. He estimated that the temperature was well over 100 degrees. I believe that there was loud music and who knows, maybe Meow Mix was even pumped into it. Um, but let's take that example and then turn it into a hypothetical. Let's say that after several hours of this kind of treatment, this particular detainee turns, tells his interrogator that he saw Omar Cotter, a Canadian teenager who's being held at Gitmo, hiding in an orphanage back in Afghanistan, lying in wait for US soldiers as they were searching, going house to house searching for people. When a medic walked into the room where Omar was hiding, the detainee told the interrogator, Omar opened fire, killing the medic. Even with the military commission's evidentiary standards being somewhat different than civilian or military court, what effect will this evidence have? I would expect that Cotter's defense attorneys would argue that such evidence was coerced and should not be admissible. This is what worried and continues to worry FBI agents and naval criminal investigators who have worked on putting together the cases for the military commissions. This is also an issue that could tie the commission into knots. This is where the stress and duress techniques could come back to haunt the Pentagon and give people like me lots to write about. But will the defense attorneys learn how this information was obtained? Will prosecutors stymie those efforts by using this new label that has been created with the military commissions called protected information? Will they use this label to hide the methods and means by which the evidence was obtained. In short, will we ever know? Eventually, I think we will. But will someone be locked up for years or even executed before we do? As you know, it's happened in the civilian system. Secrecy is the best cover there is for hiding weak or suspect evidence. By stamping the words classified or protected information on coerced confessions or hearsay that is three, four, or five times removed from a source a prosecutor can bluff his way to a conviction. 
by relying on informants of questionable background and motive, it may be difficult to identify those who truly were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Thank you. Well, I have a relatively thankless task of, uh, of arguing that military commissions are both legal and, and, and make sense. And I'll try to stick a little bit of my remarks, although I'm tempted to, uh, to respond a little bit to the points that were made earlier. Um, one claim I sort of like to tackle first is the notion that the 1949 Geneva Conventions somehow prevent the United States from trying Guantanamo detainees and military commission has been uh, elucidated in various forms, both here and, and, and by our, uh, in other settings. Uh, I think to put it in a nutshell, and this to me is an easy issue, it ain't. So, some of the issues, by the way, that Tony was talking about and, and Lou Fisher were talking about are difficult issues, so I'll save it to last. But legal issues here, I think, are quite simple. It's true they have an Article 102 of, for Geneva Convention that mandates, and, and Scott made this point earlier, that if you're a POW, uh, you have to be treated basically, you can only be prosecuted in the same way as the members of the armed forces of detaining power. I think that uh, uh, the argument, at least, and you know, stick for a second with uh, Al-Qaeda, the government that uh, uh, Al-Qaeda detainees are not covered, uh, or captured Al-Qaeda members are not covered by the Geneva Convention on Lawful Combatant, at least to me, a, a fairly, fairly easy. Um, also, I'm not impressed. I, I, I read Robertson's opinion quite carefully and read the government's brief, and it's always risky to do that, but I would venture a very strong guess that it will be overturned by the D.C. Circuit, because I think his opinion, to put it mildly, is deficient in a number of key respects, including the somewhat amusing claim that there is, a, a, a if you will, a, a private remedy on the Geneva Convention, which, of course, flies in the face of of Supreme Court's own position in Eisentrager, and many of you may recall that the Supreme Court kind of, shall we say, uh, dis dismantled Eisentrager a little bit in the Rousseau case, but not in respect to this part of the opinion. And the Supreme Court said Eisentrager pretty clearly, but 1929 Geneva Convention, which is the predecessor to 49 Convention, did not in entail such a right of action, and nothing happened between 29 and 49 to suggest that it does. Um, so I don't think Geneva Convention is, is a problem in Al-Qaeda case because Al-Qaeda is not a high contracting party. There are some folks who claim that Geneva Conventions are triggered by geographical location of a conflict and not by the set of parties involved. I think it is a, put it mildly and gently, an utter misreading of, of, of a convention and sort of does violence to the whole framework for, uh, for it. Um, but even if, even if you assume that Al-Qaeda somehow was potentially subject uh, to a convention, or benefited from a convention, as, as indeed the administration decided, is the case of Taliban. Again, you, you heard this undoubtedly uh, zillions of times by now. You look at the four criteria. Uh, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, on the traditional, the, the uniforms, part of, uh, as a part of group of discernible command structure, bearing arms openly, and institutional commitment to the laws of war. And Al-Qaeda clearly does not foot the bill. Uh, Colleagues of mine and I, back in late 2001, then this issue was joined for the first time, wrote a long paper analyzing Al-Qaeda's record. And I recall we concluded that uh, the group did not meet any of the criteria for meeting lawful belligerency. And again, you have to do all of them. Um, and of course, as we know only too well, Al-Qaeda not only doesn't do it, but actually proclaims rather helpfully that they're not interested in any of compliance with use and bellow, that they're going to target civilians uh, et cetera, et cetera. Our paper also, by the way, analyzed Taliban's track record and concluded that, which is ultimately the administration's position, that while perhaps unlike al-Qaeda, they could theoretically qualify for Geneva level protection, they did disqualify themselves. And one, one fact, I don't know how well it's known, but Mullah Omar, who is the Supreme Leader of Taliban a number of years before September 11, very conspicuously and very publicly disclaim any intent to comply uh, with the traditional laws and customs of war, disdaining them to be a sort of Judeo-Christian conceit, not binding upon Muslim holy warriors. And of course, uh, uh, the proper interpretation of international law is that if the supreme leader of a, of a given combatant organization explicitly denies the applicability of laws and customs of war and says, we're not going to be bound by it, that pretty much seals the fate of the folks who are fighting for him, to put it very crisply. 
even if you had a very saintly Mother Teresa-like person who joins that kind of an organization, she would still be an unlawful combatant, courtesy of Mullah Omar. Uh, and there are other reasons to get to, but we don't have time as to why Taliban does not, does not qualify. So there's really nothing about Geneva Conventions that creates a problem here for military commissions. Now, I don't have enough time to get into some of the historical examples that Lou elucidated in great detail. But suffice it to say, at least we can all agree, which was not the case for early critics, that military convention, uh, commissions are not the invention of a Bush administration. And they've been around for a long time. We have perhaps some nuanced differences as to how good or bad they are. The only thing I would say to Lou is I can come up with plenty of horror stories about state courts or federal district courts rendering some very suspect decisions. Um, I don't disagree with his point about Major Andre, although I would say a serious historian of a founding generation may disagree with the notion that, that uh, GW presiding over this military commission, by the way, for those of you who think we're being too harsh, very brief presentation of effect. Major Andre was a gentleman, he was a British officer. He just happened to be caught between US lines and he was not doing anything terrible, well, he was doing some negotiations, so we say without getting into details. And all he's done basically was being caught without a uniform behind our, our lines. And he was executed by a military commission. And the notion that, that, that the framers were George Washington being both a member of, of a Philadelphia Convention as well as our first president, that they would write a constitution that did not incorporate an executive slash commander in chief power and the notion of, of holding such a thing, but he himself did as, as a, our supreme leader, military leader during the Revolutionary War is, is somewhat fantastic. But I don't want you to belabor this point except to point out that it's fair to say that military commissions were used a lot, ladies and gentlemen, in World War II, a lot. Not just in the Imashita case, there were hundreds, hundreds of military commission cases in Germany. Uh, below the Nuremberg level. And as a matter of fact, in terms of harshness, uh, I think that, uh, that that little factoid is from the testimony of uh, the current head of Homeland Security Department, Mr. Chertoff, who pointed out that their acquittal rate actually compared favorably with that of federal district courts. And this is military commissions processing a very bad bunch of people. I don't know if they had we didn't, of course, have all the innocents like we have in Guantanamo now, but these were basically junior and mid-level Nazi war criminals. And they, because military officers, by and large, well, I'm not one, I would, I would say that if, well, despite some structural issues here, military officers do make good jurors. They take their oath seriously. So you had people basically acquitting people at the rate that compares favorably with folks being acquitted for various garden variety crimes in, 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 in district courts. And as the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court did say in both Yamashita and Kieran, whatever else we can talk about, all the other historical oddities, that it was kosher, ladies and gentlemen, to have military commissions in appropriate circumstances be invoked. Now, I don't have much time to get into the UCMJ. I find the argument, however, that UCMJ bans military commissions because of reference to uh, you know, discussion on Article 36, uh, somewhat bemusing uh, because, of course, there are at least nine places in UCMJ that do talk about military commissions. So if you interpret Article 36, which talks about the procedures have to be, you know, uh, consistent with a court martial's rules. If you parse that article uh, uh, in, in a way that the critics do, Basically, all of their other references to military commissions in UCMJ are just irrelevant. They're garbage, and I wouldn't belabor you with Latin, but the, the proposition that you do a statutory interpretation of one article that renders nugatory a bunch of things that are in the same statute, to put it mildly, is not particularly favored by, by the courts. Um, before, I also think it's totally atextual because, of course, UCMJ, ladies and gentlemen, is a linear descendant. It's a recodification of articles of war. And uh, before I sort of switch the re remainder of my time to some policy issues, I mean, it's important to know, frequently this administration gets kicked for the argument that they didn't go to Congress to get explicit authorization from military commissions. I find this argument utterly unpersuasive because we know that Articles of War authorize military commissions. Even if you don't believe me that that's what they said, that's, that's the case in the Supreme Court found to be inquirent. UCMJ is the recodification of Articles of War. We didn't abolish that. There's some slight wordage tweaking. So what we have actually is an old congressional authorization of military commissions. And 
I can tell you the fact that it's old does not render it somehow a suspect. We have a lot of statutes in the book that go back to the 1800s and, and even earlier. So Congress, while they did not come and look at this issue de novo, certainly has not withdrawn its blessing for military commissions. Um, I don't want to get into this somewhat philosophical debate about whether the president has plenary power to organize military commissions. I think, I think the president does, and we can get into it in the Q&A uh, uh, period. Uh, and whether Congress has to authorize them, or as I think is a better rendition of a historical record, has lent its support to it or affirmed it. But to me, the military commissions we have today, ladies and gentlemen, are about as well authorized as you can. I mean, the, the, some of the philosophical problems, which I'll get into in a second, the quality of justice and everything, wouldn't be cured if Congress came back and passed the one-line statute again, which I don't think they need, saying the military commissions are authorized. Now, let me get into some of the points that, that Tony made about, you know, why, uh, why are military commissions not most horrible and, and, and suspect bodies? In fact, the broader proposition, why not use civilian courts? Because civilian courts would not work particularly well, and I think that it's not just a, uh, this, the spectacle of, of a Mosawi trial, but um, you just cannot come up with authentication, chain of custody, and all the normal rules that exist in, in, in civilian courts and replicate them on a battlefield. So leaving aside all the more difficult issues of involuntary confessions and everything, just from a standpoint of, if you remember, you know, things like OJ trial, uh, you, would, <laughs> you would conclude that it is impossible to collect evidence on the battlefield. It's nothing to do with confessions, just say physical evidence tying somebody to the battlefield. His, you know, his machine gun, his personal sidearm. You cannot collect this evidence in a way that would withstand an attack by a good defense counsel in a federal or state court in this country. And uh, on the issue, and, and by the way, uh, as far as military justice is concerned, uh, the normal military justice court martials, perhaps it would be a controversial point, but I think since the end of World War II, they have become almost like civilian courts, which is why I think they're a lot less controversial even for people who are very much interested in, in, in civil liberties. So basically, the court martials, for all practical purposes, with exclusionary rules, of rules of procedure, evidentiary rules, are fundamentally no different from federal district courts. I, I, I have basically different jury poll, a very intelligent, very conscientious jury poll. So what do we do? I mean, it's, it's, a real, it's a real pickle, it seems to me. If we are going to take the position, let's leave the law out of it. Geneva Convention, President's plenary powers, elect their off. Let's just ask a basic question. We have a bunch of people who are enemy combatants. I would submit to all due respect to Tony, not all of them are innocent shepherds who have been kidnapped, oppressed into service, or sold by, uh, by Pakistani officials. A fair number of them are, in fact, we know, uh, how do we know that? Because a fair number of them have been released, ladies and gentlemen, and have gone back and started fighting again. So at least we've got to those folks, we know that they were actually bad guys. How do we deal with them? How do we deal with them? And all the problems that were described with regard to bad evidence, misunderstood, you know, interpreting uh, interpreters, et cetera, et cetera. All those, uh, all those problems would bedevil the civilian court system even more. And I, for one, would rather accommodate those problems, growing pain and all, in a military commission system than try to, to torque with the federal rules of criminal procedure and federal district court system to accommodate them. But accommodate them we must. Otherwise, what are we supposed to do? I mean, one of the biggest, most important humanitarian advances in all of war was many centuries ago an obligation to give quarter. And people were rendered, of course, they come by, try to surrender. You were not supposed to kill them out of hand. You were supposed to take them into custody. Unless we can detain and hold those people and prosecute those people for their offenses, we're not going to win this war. And it, it, the problem with a lot of critics is they're not coming in with most critics, I would say, perhaps, you know, in a, a, not a very uh, a fair <laughs> rebuttal, I'm not coming up with any good explication as to why those tensions can be accommodated through a court martial system or through the civilian court system. And all those problems would still be there. Now, last thing I would say, which is perhaps a, a new argument for some of you, perhaps not, 
Why is military commissions important, both practical and imperative aside? The President said shortly after September 11 that this war is about ideas. It's about symbols. It's not just about soldiers in the battlefield. To me, integral to this war is our ability to delegitimize, and I don't mind putting it that starkly because it's fair to put it this way, people who are fighting against us. Not because of their ideology, not because of their goals, but how we go about it. War is a horrible business under the best of circumstances. And lawful combatants have always been viewed as a scourge of humanity. If you don't subscribe to it, you don't subscribe to anything resembling humanitarian laws of war. So we have to le delegitimize the people involved. Because we're very humanitarian now. We don't do things with Major, like Major Andre, who had a short trial and was executed. And we don't kill spy and saboteurs out of hand. There are very few operational differences left between lawful combatants who are basically honorable soldiers who had a misfortune of being captured by the enemies, and unlawful combatants who are not to put fine of a point on it, a scum. And one of the very few differences is that one set of people, if they violate laws of war, uh, get to be tried by courts martial. And the other set of people gets tried by military commissions. And there are issues relating to how they can be interrogated. But that's about it, basically. And they don't, you know, unlawful combatants have no combatant immunity. To me, despite all the criticisms of military commission and all the beating we've taken in, in, from our allies and various other people in the world, which is all true, it is essential if we're going to try to turn the tide and delegitimize the people who are unlawful combatants, who are killing civilians as a matter of choice, who seek to kill civilians. If we give up on military commissions, we would further erode already this very fragile ability on our part to delegitimize those folks. And then we'll be arguing about their goals. And you know what, when it comes to goals, I don't think we should be passing, well, we can pass normative judgments, but certainly not legal judgments. So to me, military com preserving military commissions is a very important symbolic goal. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I sought to get a wide variety of views on this panel. I think, I guess I succeeded. Uh, let me offer a comment and then I want to open it up for your question. There are many of us who have spoken or written on this issue of military commissions that find, us, that, that find ourselves in the unique situation of defending parts of the system and criticizing parts of the system. I, for one, as, as David and Lou know, firmly believe the President of the United States has the independent authority to create a military commission unless he is challenged by Congress. Lou and many other serious commentators uh, disagree with that. It is an open question. Maybe the Supreme Court will decide that. But there's case law that you can read both ways on that issue. Um, there are others who, who are very critical of the commission system and yet defend parts of it. One thing, though, I think we all must agree with is that those who are charged with operating the system from John Altenberg all the way down, the military officers, the judge advocates, the Bob Swans, the Will Guns, the defense, senior defense attorney for all the detainees, are professional military lawyers who, although many of the military legal community were shut out and their voices not heard on other decisions in the war on terrorism, they are surely the ones that, regardless of any flaws in the charter documents, will make this as fair a system as it can possibly be. And I think that's something that, in many ways, no matter how we view military commissions, that we as a people need to be proud of, that these military officers being put in a very difficult situation, as was Colonel Royal, a North Carolinian, in the first Kieran case, are challenging the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief. And they are doing so with vigor and with integrity and as lawyers. And if you've heard any of them speak, or Commander Swift, who is actually arguing the Hamden case, I think that is something, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with a position, we should take pride in. So let me invite your questions on what is right or wrong with the system. We'll start in the back with uh, Dean Hudson, I believe it is. Thank you. Uh, I'm a supporter of, uh, of the concept of commissions, but I am troubled by some of the implementation and some of the rules re regarding review and things like that. 
is it possible to have what is essentially a court martial and still relax the rules of evidence and procedure to accommodate some of the things that David talks about? Because I understand that we've got privates and lance corporals gathering evidence and you have to deal with the chain of custody so that just taking the military rules of evidence and procedure and you, or the federal rules of evidence and procedure for that matter and using those as, as the standard uh, won't, simply won't work. So we are where we are. Is it possible to, to have a military judge, to have a military uh, court of members, prosecutor, and all of that, but change the rules of procedure and evidence such that we'd be able to accommodate a wartime scenario? Thank you. Sounds like an appointing authority question to me. Uh, I, th I think that uh, I think it's possible to have a system that uh, looks for guidance from the existing statutes and modifies those statutes accordingly to conform to the needs of our current situation. So I agree in theory that that, that is possible. I don't know if you find that responsive, Dean Hudson, or not. I, I don't know that you'd call it a court-martial because a court-martial is a certain entity. Um, and uh, th there would be, I think, problems in using the court-martial system given the nature and quality of the evidence in, in these circumstances, especially the, the, uh, the battlefield conditions and the like. David? I'd like to answer it a little broader. Uh, to me, the real issue is, is, is this. Can we come up with a level of due process that is sufficient to make us comfortable as Americans, as civilized people, that allows us to uh, nevertheless address this very difficult set of policy imperatives? And the answer for me is unambiguously less. Uh, yes, and I'll elaborate. But one thing that's interesting, again, made me, your question made me think of, of, of uh, Tony's excellent you know, comments on, 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 on what, what went wrong. It's a growing pain. It's inherent. Every time you switch from one set of rules to another, be it interrogation rules or be it prosecution rules or be it, you know, how you drill or how you fight. And, and, and then people went from small, small war muskets to rifle barrels, there was a hell of a confusion. That, that, that's not, to me, sufficiently damning of what you come up with because if the old system does not accommodate the core imperatives and the new system does, you go for those growing pains. But look, from a due process perspective, and it's very important briefly to point out how other countries have implemented this, both Article 5 type hearings, which I've, I've heard mentioned, but also military commissions. You know, ladies and gentlemen, they're very, first of all, there are very few countries, a handful, who have even done Article 5 hearings. And those who have, not only have not allowed people to be represented by counsel, most of them don't even have the individual whose status is being challenged present. You have a couple of officers, in the Canadian case, I believe one, sitting and reading the file. Because this is a different terrain. This is a different environment. This is warfare. So actually, we are trying to give the level of due, accord the level of due process to people involved that far exceeds anything ever done in history in this type of a setup. And I just, I just frankly don't understand why that is not the normative context in which people look at it, versus comparing that with a, you know, if a glove does not fit, you've got a, a quid type scenario, because that's not the relevant comparison. And, and the last point I would say is that, to me, the fundamental difference is not, with all due respect, is even a matter about confessions and evidence. There's a fundamental problem of court martial and certainly civilian courts, is the right of confrontation, where accused has to be present. In an environment where a lot of our evidence comes from people we're still at war, are still out there. But notion that we want an accused al-Qaeda member here in person, the incriminating evidence given by somebody who may be still a member of an al-Qaeda cell borders on absurd. And yet, in court martials and civilian courts, you have a right to be there. If, if I had to force everything else, strip everything else from military commissions, we would get that damn thing in place, it would be worthwhile. Lou? Yeah, uh, Scott talked about the quality of the people who are defense counsel, military people. Uh, I've met many of them, uh, very, very high quality. I don't think that 
takes us as far as we have to go because even if you're exceptionally skilled defense counsel in the military uh, with integrity, uh, what do you do when the person you're defending is accused of crimes on the basis of sources that are not going to be revealed? Uh, we haven't talked about the mobs, MOBBS declaration. This is how President Bush made his designation of enemy combatants. Mobs, as I understand, is the GS-15 and the Pentagon who Every, everything he has is third-hand information, hearsay, gleaned from different intelligence documents, uh, and no defense counsel of, of, of whatever skill is going to be able to get past those paper documents and get to the source as to who these informers are. And, and some of the analogies we've had in the criminal law system in the past where the government, not talking about military law, would say they have an informer, but we can't tell you who it is, and the courts would say either tell us who it is or drop the charges. So I think we have a, a situation here, just basic due process. How, do, how does someone defend himself when you do not know the uh, credibility of a source or what the motivation of the source is? So I think that's basic problem. In the Masawi case we talked about, I mean, it's very unusual. We have, it's very, I'd like to see some people talk about that. I mean, that's the one that got in the civil courts. That's the one that everyone thought would be starting off at a military tribunal. And I think the circus quality of the Masawi trial was the fact that Judge Brinkman allowed him to represent himself. I think that probably was not a good idea. And, and also, he couldn't represent himself very well because he could not gain access to documents that his attorneys could. Uh, so I think that went off in the wrong. I think what the problem, and in terms of military officers, I have a lot of respect for military law and military system. But I think that the Bush administration got off on the wrong foot by basically elbowing out the military professionals. I think that was done from the start. Uh, they were never trusted. I don't know if they're trusted today. I mean, they're in, in it, but I, that's my impression. Okay. Tim? Yeah, hi. I think, I guess my question is, is whether we're ignoring what I see to be the fundamental flaw with these military commissions, and that is that you've essentially invented an entire system of justice that applies only to uh, your, your enemy in a war. And, and isn't it, you know, the real protection that we have provided in the past is the idea that you don't, you have the same set of standards for yourself as those that you apply to other people, and that military commissions in the past, uh, with respect, Mr. Rifkin, they were never different for the enemy than they were for American soldiers. They were different than court martials are today, but military commissions applied the rules of court martials of that earlier time. Uh, and I, I would take the example you gave um, of President Washington as a good example. Does anyone today think that it would be acceptable? If someone who was a, uh, an intelligence officer or a special forces officer not in a uniform who did nothing else and was caught behind enemy lines would be taken and shot? I think the answer to that is clearly no. We wouldn't think that was acceptable if it was done to somebody on our side. Does anybody think it would be acceptable to take an American soldier who was accused of war crimes and try them in a commission that doesn't have the basic rules of due process that court marshals have? And the answer to that is no. And so if we don't think any of those things are acceptable, you know, it, isn't that the fundamental flaw, that we've created a system of justice that applies different rules for uh, people who are not Americans than it would apply for Americans in exactly the same situation facing accusations of war crimes or, you know, the most heinous kinds of crimes imaginable, and yet we would afford them um, either a civilian trial with all those protections or a military trial with the traditional protections uh, that are afforded there. And, and that, that if we're willing to accept that we have the right to define an inferior system of justice for our adversaries, doesn't that put our forces at risk because we've set a precedent that says that when our forces are captured, that our adversaries can, they can ignore their laws and their, and their system and simply devise some kind of second rate, second class system that they only apply to our captured soldiers and wouldn't apply to their own citizens or their own soldiers. Well, 
there are several, at least in my opinion, I don't question your sincerity and passion, uh, errors of fact and, and law. First of all, uh, the rules have changed, and that's kind of a pedantic point in regard to the treatment of spies and saboteurs. So you cannot execute them summarily, but let me assure you, the rule still very much is that a spy or saboteur could be executed after a basic trial, being spy and saboteur. As a policy matter, we probably would not do it, but it would not be illegal. But on the more fundamental point, the question all lawyers are trained to ask, one of the very first questions is what processes do? We all agree that the process that is due in a, in a situation involving a loss of property or deprivation of social security benefit it, it is different uh, than the due process involved in a criminal trial, the due process involved in a civil trial. We are not on the same page at all if you do not appreciate the proposition that the military justice system, be it of a court martial variety or military commission variety, is fundamentally different, features a fundamentally different way of balancing conflicting imperatives, okay? Of, in, of liberty and due process and military necessity. It's always been this way. I mean, maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe we're so civilized and so advanced we should not do that. But it's always been the case. So to say grandly that the level of due process involved in most commissions is not the same as the level of due process involved in court martial and not the same as the level of due process involved in federal district courts, I grant you that. But the question is, is that wrong? And I would say, no, it is not wrong. Because warfare presents a unique, the rules for using force, by the way, by police officers are very different Okay, and the rules of using force in combat. It is there for a good reason. But you're defending a system of tribunals which is fundamentally different and inferior to the basic system yes, of court martial. I am martyrs. only defending it. I am exalting it because I would submit to you that throughout the entire humanitarian law of war runs a clear connection between how you behave prior to capture with the level of treatment you get after capture. And the reason you do that is because you're trying to inculcate restraint, which is very inimical to human nature. You're trying to make sure that people behave, that they don't use force excessively. You don't want to attack civilians. Okay? So, yes, that's why I was talking about Presumes symbolism. Guilt. I am absolutely 100% for treating unlawful combatants differently than lawful combatants, even the ones who've been accused of war crimes, because unlawful combatants are the scourge of humanity. By definition, they will not do anything right. They have to be suppressed. This is not the invention of this administration. This rule is going back to the beginning of modern law of war. And the last point is as to mistreatment that our soldiers would suffer. Two points. First of all, our soldiers have been mistreated in every single conflict since the Geneva Convention was adopted. Brutalized, killed. Look at the stats in Korea. Look at Vietnam. Look at Gulf War. Two, the people we're fighting today are beheading and torturing people. If I'm an American soldier captured in combat, I would love to go before military commission instead of going before uh, the, the folks we have in place today. So let's not even talk about reciprocity. That's a canard. But we have to be clear that we are comfortable with a level of due process. We're according people who recognizing it's not the same as that accorded to lawful combatants and not the same accorded to civilians. Okay. Anyone else on the panel want to talk to that? Okay, Ambassador Litt, yeah, I think you had your hand up. Thanks, I'm, I'm an overt bureaucrat. Uh, something that, um, <laughs> that um, Tony Losi that you said that I found very interesting, a little bit provocative, I hope I'm not way off base here, but um, you said that um, something about power uh, of anonymous bureaucrats to determine what the public what information the public has access to and what it does not. And I thought that there might be scope here for, for some parallels between information obtained by military interrogators that they then have to vet uh, and pass through a prosecutorial system to get out through uh, the vehicle of, of, this, of a military commission, and information that uh, quality investigative journalists uh, try to obtain, they have to vet, and then they get out through a vehicle of a media. And whether there is something about the art and science of what investigative journalists do that could be shared with interrogators about how you obtain information from either willing or hesitant <laughs> or reluctant people who have access to some secret information, how you vet it as to whether it is 
right or not and get it out through some vehicle. Do you have? It, it, I think what I was what, what I'm referring to is this this process of um, of classifying information, and, and it, now I admit it's 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 convoluted and I don't understand all of it and I think there are a lot of prosecutors who don't understand it and my understanding from, from covering federal courts for years and years is, is that often um, and what I was referring to there was is often um, prosecutors wind up in spy cases for example uh, in cases where the SEPA you know the Classified Information Protection Act is implicated they wind up fighting more with the CIA and the FBI than they do with the defense and what happens is you have this tension. Prosecutors want to use evidence to get a conviction. They want evidence to be put before a jury. And you'll have CIA and FBI agents saying, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. The world will end um, if you put that in. Um, and that's what I'm referring to. There, there are people, you know, nameless, faceless people who are doing that, deciding what is classified and what is not. And Judge Brinkema in the Massawi case went on a rant a couple of years ago I, cause you, in, a, in a closed hearing that we later got to see the redacted transcript of where she was talking about how frustrated she was by these people who have enormous power to decide what stays secret and what doesn't. And her job and what she's got to do now um, since the Supreme Court refused to take the Masawi case, she's got to sit there and try to figure out, okay, boys and girls, you know, let's compromise. How are we going to get this piece of information before the jury in public? And you've got to get both sides to wiggle a little bit. That's what I was referring to. But, you know, I mean, I think interrogators, I mean, the, the, at least the ones, the folks I know, um, it's, it's different when you're interrogating. And this probably goes to the social scientists who are in the room uh, and the panelists we had yesterday. Um, the, the Middle Eastern mindset is very, very different from ours. And when Heather McDonald was talking about her NYPD, blue, you know, her NYPD blue detective, um, who wants to get that ADA and, and he can go in there and get information out of these people, well, according to my my Navy folks, that's ridiculous. It would it it would be a complete disaster because they don't think the way we do. Asking a, a Middle Easterner, hey, where's that bomb? What, what's the address? They're going to talk about whether you know. They're going to go around and talk about all these other people. So, so no, it's 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 much more complicated than that. General Altenberg, um, everything that Tony has said about the difficulty in cases that have protected information, classified information, is absolutely true, and it's no less true in the cases that are moving forward to trial uh, in the military commission context. Um, it, it's problematic, and. Um, People are working hard to sort their way through that the same way they do in the civilian sector, prosecutors. And I think that uh, an advantage in this context is that uh, uniformed military prosecutors, um, by, their, by their history, by their tradition, by the, by the way they've operated for years, are very prone to trying to find a way to get the defense whatever they need. And so uh, I believe that they will work assiduously uh, with various government agencies and with various bureaucrats who want to keep things classified to get as much declassified as possible to at least get to declassified summaries uh, because there is a stronger instinct I think and the, and the military people in the room I think would bear this out there's a stronger instinct on the part of military prosecutors to tee up to the defense as much discovery as possible you don't find that same um, trait in the civilian sector, because the law doesn't require it, quite frankly. You know, you get, you, okay, defense counsel, you get, the, you get this statement when, when the witness testifies, and we'll show you what the prior statement looks like. And in the military, there's a much more full and open discovery process, and, and that's the, I mean, that's the culture these people come from. And, and I know that, uh, that, that that's the direction that they're going. And so uh, I'm optimistic that there'll be perhaps more success uh, maybe in part because of the, the, the nature of the commissions themselves and the fact that people want them to be successful um, in, in solving that problem. But it, but it is no less a problem in this context, I assure you. Okay. We'll take a couple more questions. Uh, one, Jackie, and then we'll get to you. Covering this sort of stuff, certainly at the very beginning, we had great concerns. And one of them, really, I think Tony would agree with, was a 
the de quality of the defense attorneys. How could they really go in there and de defend these people and that type of thing? And we've been completely wrong on that. They've been, you know, they've grasped everything. They've done everything they can to really help these people, and they're very dedicated. But there have been other concerns that were there at the beginning and are probably uh, bigger now. And one of them, um, just to name one, is the makeup of the panel that are that is overhearing these cases. And in August, I mean, it became very apparent very quickly that there were problems with this. Um, and you know, as we thrashed out later, we thought that <laughs> there were two things that could be done. One is make it the panel complete with people who had a good grasp of the law and you could stay with the presiding officer or um, have a judge and you know use lay people, so to speak. Um, and I just wondered if this is something, as you mentioned, David, that you know it's a, it's a process that's evolving in that. And I just wondered if that was one of the things that um, the appointing authority or certainly the administration, whoever's going to have a hand in this, would think about changing the next time around. Because obviously in voir dire, we lost, what, four? Three. Three, yeah. Well, I, uh, true that we lost three people on voir dire, but uh, um, for the most part, they were conflicted out. Uh, and it wasn't because of a lack of knowledge of the law, I don't think. Um, and I do recall uh, reading in the newspaper account that, that one officer professed a lack of knowledge of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, alarming to all of us in the military that uh, someone of that rank and experience would, would have to make a statement like that. Um, I think that uh, it was interesting also with regard to the panel member uh, selection process that uh, there was criticism that how could you put people on the panel who, uh, who had been in Afghanistan and who had these experiences, you know, that would later disqualify them and uh, why didn't you vet the panel members better than that? And I thought that was curious that on the one hand, uh, the military process is always criticized because someone, the appointing authority or a convening authority literally selects panel members. Uh, and in my experience, that works because it's done very objectively and it's done very carefully and it's done very fairly and it's not a hand-picked, let's get these guys convicted approach. And yet, on the other hand, they were wondering why we didn't vet them better. You know, I mean, they, they weren't vetted because we didn't explore it any further than that. We just looked at what their qualifications were and, uh, and then looked at, to, to find out what they'd done specifically uh, in any certain context. Um, in the military law uh, business, there are always allegations that, uh, that, that this can't be fair because this convening authority picks these court members. And that, that's said in every one of these, especially high profile trials that my client can't get a fair trial because the person that sent this case to trial picked the court members. And, and then they're, they're never around after there's an acquittal. And they're never around after there's a really, uh, a, a, what would someone call a, a very unsevere sentence in what was ostensibly a very severe case. Um, and the fact is that even though court members in the military are selected by a convening authority, the conviction rate in the military is almost identical to all civilian jurisdictions. And, and people knowledgeable about criminal law know what an appropriate conviction rate is, uh, including guilty pleas and not including guilty pleas. And those numbers are the same in the military. And, and, and uh, you know, I used to say in talking to senior leaders who were about to become summary court convening authorities and special court convening authorities, that there were only two explanations for that phenomenon, you know, because the allegation was always there's unlawful command influence. Somebody is picking people that are going to sit on the jury. Uh, and, and there's no question that it has the appearance of impropriety and that it's rife with the potential for abuse. But in my experience, it doesn't happen. At any rate, the two possible explanations for the phenomenon that even though someone handpicks court members, um, the conviction and acquittal rates are almost identical to the civilian sector is the following. One, um, the system is fair, and military officers especially understand what obligations they bring to the courtroom. And so uh, they've taken two votes, one as a commissioned officer to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and then one as a court member. And they take it extraordinarily seriously, and they're very educated, and they're very serious about our values. The other possible explanation is that we're just not very damn good at unlawful command influence. 
Okay, let, let me, uh, in the interest of ensuring that my colleague Chris Schrader gets his full measure, we're going to take two very brief last questions. You, sir, and then Judge Everett, did, did you have your hand up or not? No, okay. We'll take one and then two. Keep them brief, please. I'm sorry, I will be very brief. Ben Davis, University of Toledo College of Law. The question is, if the effort is to delegitimize these people, then why are we basing the category for these people on a procedure that sounds like comes from World War II, which was a delegitimized procedure that we re re revised with the Uniform Court of Military Justice. There's a place outside of uh, Paris where there are 90 dead people executed under the procedures that were done in World War II. 70 of them were black. And there's a book coming out by somebody here from Duke named Alice Kaplan about that case. So uh, that's my question is why does it to delegitimize them, we use a old version of Articles of War uh, procedure that was delegitimized. At least that's it seems. John? Um, first of all, I'm very familiar with Plot E and the 94 soldiers that are buried there and the fact that there's an extraordinarily disproportionate number of African American soldiers that were part of that process. And there is no conclusion to draw from reading those facts than to draw that uh, they were they were discriminated against and that the, and the process wasn't fair. Um, but I would tell you that that wasn't because of the process itself. That was because of the parties involved, because of the people that were part of the process. And in any state court or federal court, um, we can write all the laws we want. We can write all the procedures we want. We are no better than the persons that we put in charge as prosecutors, as defense counsels, as judges. And I would, I would tell you that that's the difference. We'll, we'll take one last question. Hi, Tyrone Brown, is this on? Department of Justice. My question is for uh, Mr. Ripton. In regard to your, um, your response to uh, Mr. Edgar's regarding unlawful combatants, I think I agree with your statement about um, the process we are giving them. But my question to you is, how concerned with you are the due process that, um, I guess, defines them as enemy combatants? Because I think that process might have flaws in it. And I wasn't really aware of, of your comment on the process that makes them enemy combatants. I know what your comment is after they are declared that. But I think there might be a, a bit of an issue with that process to that point. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, and that's actually probably one of my strongest criticism. If there is this other level of due process that attaches by virtue of you belonging to a particular group, and let's say that that level of due process is not as, as elaborate as the one we're accustomed to, doesn't it put a particular premium on the quality, the rigor of the initial classification decision? Yes, there is something to be said for this argument, but, but here again, even at the front end, one needs to understand that it is impossible to replicate. But again, let me give you first the easy answer. The easy answer is that nothing in Article 5, Article 5 talks about a competent tribunal. It doesn't, that's Geneva Convention 3, which is sort of a highest elaboration of this stuff. It doesn't provide for any discussions that they have to be operating as adjudicators, finders of fact, that they have to sit and convene, that this to be done on an individual basis rather than group basis. Oh wait, there's a predicate there, in case of doubt. Don't just get it all the time, it's in case of doubt. You look at ICRC commentaries. This was for folks who, you know, were out of uniform, but you know, uh, they were saying, you know, they wanted, they lost their documents, or they were wondering where civilians were deserted. But I would say this, fundamentally, the level of due process that exists at the uh, uh, Status Review Tribunal is certainly consistent with O'Connor's language in Hamdi, and ladies and gentlemen, higher than anybody in the world has ever given to anybody. And if we go beyond that and say it needs to be beyond a reasonable doubt in the criminal justice context, then it would never work. I uh, recognize the, the intellectual tension there, but I strongly support it, though I never practiced in that system, John's views about the inherent rigor of the system because it works extremely well and, and it, that, to me, provides the level of comfort which otherwise I would not receive. And just to give you two examples, I mean, command influence might put, just in the last few years, two famous court, well, I don't want to call them court martial, be technical, but you remember the, the, the skipper, submarine skipper that sunk the Japanese caller? You know, the senior guys were really out to get him because it was really mucking things up for us with the Japanese. A lot of people in Washington. 
guess what? They, you know, basically went easy on me. And the Aviano uh, cable uh, uh, car cutting, same thing. It, you really have people who are trained to resist that kind of stuff. And I can tell you one thing I've, I've heard from a couple of friends of mine who are defense lawyers, that this is a fundamental difference. If you have a guilty client, but you think you're going to get off on technicality, you're going to go before a civilian tribunal. If you have a client who's fundamentally innocent, go before a military body in any configuration, court martial, military commission. In a way, the way it works is very similar to the original jury system. No legal pyrotechnics, very much do we think as, as, as men and women in uniform, as officers, do we think that all the evidence that was put forward, including some of them in first, does it add up? Does it compute? We know about fog of combat. Is he the bad guy? If you're innocent, I would rather be before that kind of body than before the best civilian grand jury. Uh, let, let, me, uh, let me suggest to you that those of us up here are not going to be the ones making the determination about the fairness or the legality of military commission. The legality will probably be determined in our courts, one way or the other. The overall fairness, I think, is a verdict yet out. History may actually record whether what we are doing at Guantanamo Bay was prudent and appropriate. And I think I'd like to suggest that that's a verdict we must await. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and thank the panel. <laughs> We, uh, those of you uh, who have signed up for lunch, I think you know where it is in uh, the Thomas Center. And uh, if you can, I think we'd like to get back on schedule. And uh, Professor Schrader's last panel of the conference is set for 2.15 back in this auditorium. We'll see you then. Thanks.